decided I wanted to be a textual critic as well, so I started to tell them, look, when you study, I'm going to study. So that by the time I go to Bob Jones University, I'm three years ahead of everybody else. So I made him tell me everything. You know, every day I was in his house after school, making him teach me what he was learning. And all of this was just perfect. I, I knew what I wanted to do in my life. At 16 years old, I knew. I knew. I was going to become an ordained minister. I was going to preach the gospel of Christ. I was going to go get biblical uh, authority from the original sources. I was going to become a missionary and travel the world and this, that, and other. I mean, I had it laid out and knew it. This was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Now, all of that changed in the summer of 96. In the summer of 96, uh, Benjamin came to me and asked me a question. Very simplistic question, but it changed my life. He came and he asked me, he said, Joshua, um, have you ever read the Bible? And I, I'm looking at him like, you know, oh, what kind of silly question is that? Uh, because I failed to mention that he had become so busy in his textual critic studies or his uh, seminary studies that he was not able to be a full-time youth pastor anymore. So I became a part-time youth pastor while our pastor looked for a full-time youth minister. Because he knew me very well, he knew my family, I mean, he'd been in my home, I think, more times than the mailman, you know, so he knew my family very, very well, so he said yes, and I started filling it for Benjamin, they liked it, so I started pastoring young life and other things, so I'd been already, you know, getting my feet wet in, into this field already, so Benjamin was coming and asking me, have you ever read the Bible? I'm like, what kind of silly question is that? Do you not remember, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm filling it for you, you know, I'm doing your job? So what do you mean if I ever read the book? Of course I've read the book, I mean, I've read, the, I've read the New Testament, you know, a couple of times over, and I was using the scope for a reference Bible at the time, so I'd reference back and forth to the Old Testament, places here, places there, weren't that kind of ping pong reading, you know, back and forth and, and reference points. And he was like, no, 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 it's not really what I mean. I mean, have you really read the book? And I'm like, well, why don't you just, like, you know, elaborate, you know, elaborate a little bit. He said, have you read it like you would read a novel? If you read a novel, you start at the beginning. And you go to the end, page for page, word for word, so that you get the whole gist of the story. You get the whole uh, lead-in and the characters and the plot and the climax and the downfall and the ending. You know, you, you get the whole gist of the story. And you can summarize the story. You can tell me who are the major players and who are the cast members and what is this plot and if there's maybe a separate subplot going on. But you can tell me all of that if you kind of really read the book and really understood and not like all of its intricacies. And you could even write a report on it. You know? So have you read the Bible like that? I told him, I said, you know, no, I've never read it like that, beginning from Genesis 1, 1 all the way to the end of Revelation. I mean, I, I said, that's, that's a task in and of itself, because the Bible is not, it's a big book, first of all, and the word Bible itself connotes that from the, word, from the Greek, uh, from the Latin Biblos, meaning books. It is a bunch of books. Um, so it's, it's just not that easy to read, to read a bunch of books symbols. It doesn't have that kind of smooth transition all the way through. Um, so I said, no, I have never read it like that, beginning to end. He said, so how can you even begin to say that you know God's book? How can you even begin to tell people that the Bible is the idea that the diagram is basic instruction before leaving earth, and you don't know its interests? Like that. I said, that's a good question. What do you want me to do? You know, kid, 16 years old here. What do you think we should do? He said, let's take the summer of 96 and let's read the whole Bible, beginning to end, and see what God's Word says to us. Because at this point in my life, I truly was of the opinion that once you accepted the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ and His gift for humanity, of, of uh, redemption of sin, for shedding of His blood, that you accepted that as a gift, and with that gift came the Holy Spirit, which is the third person of the unique trinity of God, and that that Holy Spirit lived inside of you, and this was part of parcel of God himself. So therefore, if I'm reading God's word through the Holy Spirit, then I should be able to understand God's message to me personally, as well as the message to humanity. So we said, let's read the Bible and see what it says to us, and what do you think it's saying to the world? And it, he said, it could be very well that we come up with different, you know, opinions. We come, God says something different to you than he says to me, I see something you don't see. So comparing, we will get a long way in, in understanding God's Word. I said, sure. I mean, you can tell how much of a nerd I was at 16 years old. I spent the whole summer reading the Bible. 
But at 16, I mean, this is just how I was raised. My grandparents did not let me go to school dances and parties. And I mean, that just didn't happen before my grandfather passed away. He did, that did not happen. Everything to him was devil work. You know what I mean? School dances were devil's playground. You know what I mean? This is just my grandfather. It was very much like that. So I started reading the Bible in the summer of 96. And again, if I tell you every single little detail that, that, that led me to make the decision to be where I am standing right now, I would keep you here for, for hours upon hours upon hours. And, and I'm not going to torture you like that. Uh, I'm not going to take you hostage like that. Uh, Muslims, no hostage, Muslims in the same sentence. You know what I mean? And if we're recording that, make sure you edit that word hostage out. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I'm just not going to keep it for that long. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to tell you is the points that really were kind of cha game changers for me, what they call game changers, that really changed my whole idea and my whole ideology and what I believed in. And the main thing that stuck out to me when referencing to the Old Testament was the stories of the prophets. This was a real major point for me was the stories of the prophets, even though there was so much more. And if you want to know everything, then there, like I said, there's going to be plenty of media material out there. I'm hoping that every single Muslim is going to join me in helping me give those to the end, which I'm going to talk about. But has all those final points. But the thing that really hit me was the stories of the prophets. Because these are the major players. I mean, this is the cast of the Old Testament. This is the cast. And, you know, growing up, I had always had a certain image of prophets, you know, when you think of Moses, you get a certain, you get a certain image in your mind. When you think of Noah, when you think of Adam, when you think of Abraham, when you think of uh, David, when you think of all of these people, Jesus. Uh, when you think of all of them, you kind of get this, you know, imagery in your head, and and, and the general imagery is someone who is great, someone who is a mighty person, someone who is a very good person, someone who was God's prophet, leading God's people. You know, Showing them the right way of life, showing them what not to do and what to do, giving them the divine message, uh, directly communicating with the Creator, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, this is just a title of, of honor, a title of dignity uh, to be called a prophet, you know, God's chosen messenger to humanity. And, and this is what I have even now. But the unfortunate thing, the unfortunate thing, and, and, and this is in no way, you know, to directly condescend towards anyone's belief. It is just a simple fact that I'm going to tell you what I saw and how it changed my ideologies and where it led me to. But everyone has their own right to come up with their own deductions from the information that they're given. Unfortunately, the Old Testament does not tell that story completely of people that are great and grand and honorable and dignified and so on and so forth. There is a lot of parallel stories about God's prophets and God's messengers of the Old Testament especially that do not lead one to that same deduction and opinion at the end of the day, especially when it came to me. I'm going to give you just a few so we don't run out of time. Um, Noah was one of the first ones that I, that I came across that, that, that kind of stopped me in my tracks, which Noah is one of the earliest in, in, in the Old Testament, right after, right after Adam. And he preached for a long time, almost a thousand years. A thousand years of man's been on the earth preaching God's message. And very few people listened. So God decided to destroy this creation and start again. Because everybody was rejecting God. So God said, I'm going to wipe this off and start again with only the people who believe in them. Believe I'm going to start all over again with the people who believe in me. This is honorable, dignified. And know what, a thousand years stuck it out, preaching the same message. After rejection, after a thousand years, we give up after five days, one day, an hour, ten minutes. I mean, this is a thousand years, nine hundred and something years the man is preaching the same message. But there's another story that kind of just stopped me in my tracks. And it's, and it's the mildest that, that I came across. And it is the, sto the story of Noah, or just an occasion of Noah after the flood. Uh, apparently Noah, after the flood, which it does not give us great detail into the event, but apparently after the flood, Noah realized that if you take grapes and you ferment them, they become this very tasty drink that makes you feel really good, uh, which we know is wine. 
and you know a drink. How many times on what occasions we don't know. But that's not really the biggest thing. The problem is when we know it. In the New Testament it says Jesus turned water to wine. But the story that relates about one occasion of Noah's drinking, only one occasion in the Old Testament, which was not me. It said that Noah was witnessed. He was witnessed by someone. Someone came to look for Noah and they found him in his home, passed out, drunk, completely naked. I mean, completely naked in his home, laid on the floor, drunk. And I just stopped for a moment. I mean, it, it just, I had to take a mental pause for a moment. Just because of the fact that this was unseeming to me for a moment. That, that any of God's prophets would act in, in any kind of manner to where, I mean, you'd see them pass out on the floor, you know, completely start naked. Because uh, that goes to the root of credibility of something. Psychologically. And psychology is my field of secular studies. Psychologically, it goes to the root of credibility of an individual. Uh, no matter whether drinking is something that is bad in society or not, to take it to that level, most people would see it as something that is not auspicious, it's not honorable, it's not dignified to see a man pass out in his home completely drunk, completely naked. So I stopped and I said, wait a minute, this just seems, seems out of place for one of God's prophets. Because I'm thinking, okay, to the root of credibility, like if Noah is passed out in his home drunk, completely naked today, and I see him tomorrow, and he's telling me that God is telling him things. You know, I'm, I'm starting to question now, where, where are you hearing God? You know what I mean, when he passed out on the floor, completely naked, you know what I mean? It's kind of hard now, I mean, if you see a guy that's known, I didn't say Noah's known, but if you see someone that you know he's passed out on the park bench naked, and you're drinking, you know, urinating on himself, and he comes and tells you that God is telling you this, and you should do this, and you should do that, you're like, wait a minute, aren't you the same? I mean, I do know that God can use the most horrible of people, you know what I mean, and change them and use them as one of his vessels, but when God chooses prophets, I, I, I just thought it was on a different level, different level than, than human individuals, but I was learning. Yeah, yeah, this is my first time going through beginning to end, so I'm learning. So I keep going and say, okay, I, you know, that's in the back of my mind. I got to the story of Lot, uh, or in Arabic, he's known as Lut. Peace be upon him. And of course there is a discrepancy whether or not he was a prophet, biblically. Biblically never refers to him as a prophet. So there is a difference of opinion. We as Muslims refer to him as a prophet. Um, but whether or not we want to call him a prophet biblically, that's really of no great importance because God seemed that Noah, I mean that Lot was a, a decent enough person and his story was important enough to involve it in his book. God's Word, which is what I believe that the Bible was the inerrant, without error, Word of God. So Lot had to be important. He takes up a big chunk of God's book. So we read the story of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, which the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is, is very famous. It's known not only amongst religious people, non-religious people. I mean, everyone is probably at some point in their life heard of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see the same, so there's a similar story in Islam, the same story actually. But there's another story about Lot that's, that's not, not as honorable as his preaching to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and God eventually destroying that city for their wickedness. And this one I kind of have to tone down because I see that being true. I can't really, I can't tell it if it's explicit. It's not rated for this type of audience with the children. You have to ask them to leave the room. Um, is the story of Lot and his two daughters. See, Lot became an old man, and he had no son. He had no son, and his daughters were worried because no son means no lineage, means Lot's lineage ends with him. That's a big to-do. That's a big deal, especially amongst the Hebrews of that time. I mean, that's a big deal. Even amongst the Arabs to this day, and, and Hebrew, uh, Hasidic Jews to this day, your lineage means a lot. If you have no sons, you keep going until you get a son. You gotta have your lineage has to keep going. Um, and his daughters were worried that their father was going to die without a son. So they decided to fix the problem for themselves. And the way they fixed it was that the oldest daughter got their father intoxicated. And she slept with him one night and became pregnant by him. And just to make sure that there was a good chance of a son, the youngest daughter did the same thing. The other daughter did the same thing the next night. And now I stop. I pause again. A little bit harder pause this time. So I say, wait a minute. The story of Noah was bad. I mean, it was not decent. It wasn't the worst. But I mean, this is a little, this is a little ridiculous. 
you know, okay, God is not a prophet of God. 